Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. You'll see that we've got Torben Sundergaard with us today. I want to hope I pronounce that last name right. I always have a trouble doing that. Uh, we're going to be talking about deliverance, deliverance ministry, his story in Denmark. It's going to be an exciting episode. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Thunderguard. It's a fun name to pronounce. Uh, it's even a funner guy to interview. We're going to have a great conversation today, but before we dive into the subject matter, I want to remind you that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded. So if you want to support the ministry, you like this episode or other episodes we've produced, there are links in the description. You can give a one-time gift to pay- PayPal, or you can be a reoccurring giver there on Patreon. Lots of cool content on Patreon. I just released an episode of Francis Chan and Mike Bickle. The whole interview, you'll be seeing some of those short clips releasing here on YouTube, and we'll release uh, the whole video at the end of of the week, but we'll also be releasing videos on Patreon, full-length videos with Christine Kane, Lou Engel, Will Hart, uh, uh, Stuart Greaves, oh, oh, many, many others. Uh, really exciting stuff uh, coming out from our interviews at the Kansas City level of technology. I, I don't know what happened. We're we're back up in the chat. Miller, are you there? I'm here, but it's super uh, glitchy. Is it glitchy? Okay. Well, if, if there's a problem, I have to... Uh, double check some things on my end it looks like it's coming through smooth so i'm not quite sure what's going on uh but hey torben introduce yourself uh tell us a little about yourself and your ministry before we dive into our subject okay uh yeah very short i'm from denmark uh, live in america now uh, right now i am in uh, san diego california uh, i got baptized in the Lutheran church got confirmed without really knowing anything about god i did not know there was a new and old testament so it was just culture, culture, Christianity. When I was uh, 18 years old, I look up in the sky one day and I said, God, if you are there, come and take me. And at that time, I was thinking of UFOs would beam me up. Uh, so it shows how little idea I have of who Jesus was. But a few days later, I heard about Jesus. I got introduced to the Bible and I met God. And that was uh, 5th of April, 1995. The Holy Spirit came and I got filled with the Holy Spirit and my life got changed. So that was the beginning. Um, then I got married and I worked with church plan some years. Uh, and then a few years down, like year 2000, I came to a point where I was really frustrated about my life again, that there must be more than life than this. I, I was a radical guy. I love Jesus, but I never heal a sick. I never cast out a demon. I never led anyone to God. I never experienced the life we read about in the book of Acts. So that led me to a time of prayer fasting, where I fasted 40 days, and, and I experienced a breakthrough in my life. And... Uh, and I start to see healing, I start to see deliverance, I start to see people meet God. And, and I had a really good time for 2002 to 2004, where I was on national TV in Denmark, and I prayed for the sick through the TV, and, and, and people got healed, like through a prayer on, on secular TV, and, and they talked about it the day after, and, and I start to do meetings as an evangelist, and and was on on tv shows and all of that then uh, i i was proud and a lot of things needed to happen in my life still so for 2004 to 2007 8 god took us on a journey where we got somehow thrown out of our church uh, they went in another direction and and we couldn't go that direction so we ended up leaving and was we didn't have any choice. We need to submit to that doctrine or leave. So we were somehow thrown out. And then we start our journey with God where, where we got a house. We should never have God. My wife got sick. She had a lot of fear, anxiety, was laying in bed for many months. I lost my job and I wanted to commit suicide. I, like I was just down in the desert. But it was out there we really start to see God in a new way. It was like we were away from the church culture and the tradition. And it was a time of examining myself and our ministry and, and why do we do the things we do at church. And, and out there, 
in the journey, we start to live the book of X life in a new way and it became beautiful. And at one time I wrote a book called the last reformation. I have it here. We'll talk about, uh, back to new Testament model of discipleship. And I talked about the church system and so many people could relate to this, relate to, to what I wrote there about my frustration with the church and the church system and, and, and how we need to be better at making disciples. And, and it, it became a book that became more than a book. And nowadays like a movement all over the world, uh, by the name, the last reformation. And we have done some movies you can see behind me and, and so on. So, um, this is short, my story. And, and then, uh, three years ago, we experienced some persecution in Denmark and, and we left Denmark and came to America where I'm seeking asylum. And I've been here for three years now working with discipleship and are uh, in California. Excellent. Well, we're going to be like kind of hanging out and talking about your story in Denmark for people who kind of want to know how the show is going to go. We're going to talk about your story a little bit, specifically what happened with you in Denmark. We're going to talk about deliverance ministry in general. We'll talk about theology of that, the doctrine of that, how you practice this. And we'll even talk about, you know, is God supernaturally using you in a unique way? Um, or should we expect that all Christians should live like this? And then toward the end of the program, there are a few accusations after I posted the graphic today of, hey, um, uh, here's some things that uh, that you've been accused of. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to some of that. Yeah. So if people are waiting for that, that'll be coming towards the end of the program. So uh, uh, Torben, let's just start off with the story of you in Denmark. Can you tell us a little bit about this story? Uh, were you kicked out? Were you forced to leave? Did you flee? What, what, what exactly, how exactly should we be phrasing this story? You know, I, I've experienced a, a lot of persecution, like like many other people who are making a difference in the kingdom and, 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 and persecution on YouTube and lies and people don't agree with my theology. And, and, and this is just part of life. Then uh, a few years ago, they came for Danish TV and wanted to do a documentary about me. And I've done that two times before, actually, because I've been working with Danish TV. So I like, let's go for it. But during that time things start to change a lot and i have some very weird episode um one time we had a big bible school in denmark and we sent the all the men out of a man trip it was like where we people was walking 10 miles and then we were sleeping outside and telling testimony and just having fellowship as men and uh, at that time we people was hungry and we had bought some chickens and people slaughtered the ch chickens and then we ate the food and there's nothing wrong in this for two days later they came from the danish government and said we need to talk to your children i said why we need to talk to your children because you are on this man trip and you slaughter some chicken i'm like what but but it's not illegal to slaughter chicken we need to talk to your girls but it's not wrong to slaughter a chicken. We need to talk to your girls right now because of this man trip. But my girls was not on the man trip. We need to talk to your girls. And like, what is happening? So we, we start to experience things like this. We actually have five different agencies who come into us and checked us. One day the police came and checked the passport of every one of our school. And, and I start to like, what is going on? What is happening here? This is weird. And then they came up with the Danish programs and I found out it was not a documentary about me at all. Uh, there have been fallen some other ministry who have gone really wrong. And, and we have bad stories of people who have, have sexual misuse and people who have been in jail, like ministries or, or, or controlled with, with manipulation and other things. And, and they were filming all of it and then mixed it all together. And when the, those programs came up, it became crazy. Like I got a lot of like threats against me and like, you had to go to jail again, Torben. Like, no, I've never been in jail. That was that guy. Hey, you have to stop misusing girls. I've never misused girls. That was that guy. So, but everything was a mix. And, and then in the end of, in middle of January, I was like, it was not just three programs. I was on national TV, like 17 times in three weeks on national TV, in the news, and it became really a big thing in Denmark. And, and suddenly I saw they talked about 
uh, me and talk about police and investigation and talk about a new law. And there was a mental violence law. And, and the thing is that how do you define mental violence? Uh, if I hit somebody, I know I have done physical violence against somebody, but how do you define mental violence? And there was a whole debate going on suddenly about mental violence could be if you ground your children over a longer period, that was mental violence. And they talked about a new um, court case where they want to remove the children for the families and the mental violence law. And it just went insane. And in the end of January, I got a phone call from a friend who knew much more about it. And after that phone call, I knew this is not going to stop. This is not going to stop. Like I cannot take my family through all of this. And, and we, f we felt God said, move. If the pussy killed you in one city, move to the next. And in, in three days, actually three days, we, we, we packed down and we left Denmark. So it was not like a throwing out. There, there was not a directly court case there, but then they came with the law. I have it here actually, um, L139 where part four, we read about that uh, if you continue deliverance on minors or handicapped people, that is defined as physical violence, like the same as mental violence, it is physical violence. And it will go up to three years jail and all of that. So it was you, a mix. Yeah. Torben, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm leaving to go to Denmark tomorrow. Is yeah. there any way you can email me, email me or take a picture of that and send it to me so I could take it with me? Because I've got yeah. a lot of friends in Denmark. I have it. I, I just want to, to show that. you. I want to no, show you my I want to show my case. I can email to it. Everything is in Danish, but we have got it translated. I have a, a my, my Danish friends box. can read it. <laughs> yeah. But look here, this is my case. Oh gosh. <laughs> Remind me never to read that. Oh my so, God. So, so th th there was things about, there were things I haven't been able to share public and I cannot share public because then um, I can share it to you private, but not public because I don't want to uh, put some of the people I work with in danger in that sense. Because but I want to say that was a reason I left. It was not just for fun. And, uh, but I want to say when, and again, I was in shock. Like, I had done ministry like, 20 years at that time. And, and I've never experienced anything on this level. Uh, when I sat in Amsterdam airport, leaving for America, I was, I was still in shock and, and adrenaline was going all over. And, and, and I was like, well, how can this happen? And then it was like, God spoke to me and said, Torben, what you experience in Denmark is going to come over my people in America, but my people are not ready for what is coming. I've sent you to America to make my people ready. And then I came to Denmark and the first, you know, to America. And first thing I experienced in America was the election and Donald Trump and fake news and all of it. And then the next thing we experienced was the COVID and, and, and the fake news and, and the lies. And, and I right away saw through it all because I've been there. Like, like if, if you believe like the way they put me up in the news, I've never seen anything as bad as that. Like I should go to jail if, if those news was correct. And I saw how the news can change a mindset of people in, in few days. And, and I saw the same in America. And I believe that, that what happened in Europe will come to America and, and persecutors are coming to the church. But I want to say is there's freedom in Denmark to believe in everything you want as long as you don't practice it. <laughs> there's no, there's no <laughs> prosecution in believing in everything, but if you start to practice it, then you, you have an enemy who don't like you and then things will change. Huh? So Miller, you're going to be in Denmark casting out some demons. Uh, yeah. First thing I'm going to do is look for the handicapped and the kids to pray Jeez. for Jeez. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Just kidding. And and as as far as as we're concerned, Denmark, you can take him. We don't. We don't. Miller's all about starting church plants, and he doesn't mind doing prison ministry from the inside. So, um, <laughs> just a heads up to anyone who may be watching. <laughs>
But again, I would say, like, when people talk about persecution, and we see the early disciples, how they went through persecution and, and, and died for Christ. And, and people said, Tom, why did you leave? And I want to say, I left because God said, leave. Because if they persecute you in one city, leave to the next. So it's not like, yes, I was shocked and I was uh, somehow afraid because this is real. Like, like, it's one thing to read about. I think when we read about persecution, it sounds so pink. It sounds so like, oh, suffer for Christ. But when you're suddenly out there every day in the news, and especially with my kids uh, and my wife, it, it just go to a different level to experience that people are looking at them and, and coming after them. And um, it is not fun, but, but I want to say on the other side, God is faithful. And this is what we have seen Amen. the last year. God is faithful. And then, Torben, maybe you can give us some stories to kind of frame this discussion on on deliverance ministry, because it sounds as if you weren't doing deliverance, you know, in a confined church environment, but that you were doing these things publicly, like you were praying for people, you're doing evangelism on the streets, and people were manifesting on the streets. Can you maybe unpack some of what was going on and describe a typical deliverance ministry, deliverance story and in, in the life of Denmark? Yeah. Uh, I would say it's not, it's, it's funny because most of the persecution uh, and things that were shown on the national TV in Denmark was actually not from Denmark. It was from all over the world because most of what we did was actually outside Denmark uh, with, with uh, praying for people. But one of the things, like I had a video where I am in Paris and a girl is getting delivered outside the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And I think some of the thing is that deliverance was more something that was put in a back room in a church where we read in, in the Bible and, and how it was always public. Like, like deliverance was not something, hey, let's stop now. Let's take people away to the corner because we need deliverance here. It was something that happened right there in the public where people were. And, and because I was, I, I feel that the church really need to experience this life. That is also why we have done our two movies to really show about this life. And because we are so public with it and show it, there's people who don't like it. And then because it's on video, they, they show it to somebody who have no concept about God and don't believe in deliverance and don't believe in demons. And if it's not demons, then it, should, it must be something mental that's happening. And therefore, because they don't understand the concept, they try to judge what is happening and then it end up becoming something completely different. And Denmark is a very secular country where, where and just the whole thing that we, we have demons written in the laws now, <laughs> like, like we don't believe in deliverance. They don't believe in God at all. And then it's written down. Uh, but I, I think what I experienced even before this, I was in France doing a big meeting there and we were baptized like 60 people in the middle of the meeting, the police came in and stopped it. And I was like, everyone, the police is there, jump in the pool right now. <laughs> and, and we have massive baptisms right away. And, and when I was in the airport on the way home, they actually came and, and stopped me in the airport and took our suitcase out and visited us in the airport in France. So. I think it's, it's not so much about me, but it's the whole change that is happening. Because if it was not deliverance, it would be something else. Uh, so I think it's not only because of deliverance. I, I just believe it's, it's because light and darkness don't work together. And they're actually persecutors because the name of Jesus. But they need to find something. And some people say, to look at deliverance. Some people look at something else. I, I recall like during some of the... Uh... Like you read God's Generals by Robert Slayerton, and he talks about how certain practitioners of healing would get arrested for practicing medicine without a license. You guys remember any of this? I can't remember who the names were. Hmm. Josh, I can't name the exact guy. I mean, I read the book, but it's been 15 yeah. years. Yeah. Well, it sounds similar, though. Yeah. yeah. One okay. of the Yeah. Continue. Uh, Torben, maybe could you talk to us a little bit, and some of the people in the chat are talking about this, maybe explain what is meant by the last reformation. Yeah. First thing, many people have said, how arrogant, Torben, that you call it the last reformation. How do you know it's the last reformation? I didn't call this movement the last reformation. I called my book the last reformation. 
And and in the intro of the book, I talk about how we had the first uh, Reformation with Martin Luther in the 1500s. And then there is uh, Klaus Schwartz and other have said that there was a second Reformation where it was more the personal relationship with Christ in the 1800s. And then many scholars have said that we need to see a third Reformation. And there in the first intro to the book, I said, I don't ho hope it will be a third Reformation. I hope it will be a last one. That this time we go so much deeper and really reform the church back to the book of Acts. And that is why it's called the last Reformation. But the way I see it, like we have early Christianity where we read about the book of Acts. And then around the year 300, we got the beginning of what we know as the Catholic Church. And, and, and we have a change of church from the book of Acts to the Catholic Church. And it moved the whole way forward to the 1500. Then with the reformation of Martin Luther, he did not reform the Catholic Church back to the book of Acts. He just made a few changes here and there. We got rid of the Pope, but we kept the Sunday meeting and the church building, and we kept the baby baptism, and we kept the Eucharist and many other things the way they do it. And that reformation is what we are building on today. And there have been very small changes here and there, but most of it is still built on the Reformation and the Catholic Church. Like, why do we have church on Sundays? Because of the Catholic Church, the day of the sun and, and worship the sun God. Why do we meet in a church building the way we do it? And why do we have one priest and not an eldership of, of, of leaders? And, and, and why do we not see the fivefold ministry and all of that? So I believe we really need a deep, deep reformation of the church where we go so much deeper than we, we have ever done before and go back to the early church, to the book of Acts. And this is our heart to really somehow reform the church and come back to the, the, the book of Acts and the Bible. Okay. Now, some would argue that the church had already begun meeting on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16. Paul talks about collecting your offering on the first day of every week, Acts chapter 20, on the first day of the week, they, uh, they meet. And, uh, and of course, they practice the Eucharist together. Uh, they practice it very regularly. And this is a New Testament practice. I think you're probably in favor of practicing the Eucharist. You're just saying we don't want to do it like yeah, the Roman but, Catholics. Yeah. Uh, but, are you suggesting you we should meet on Saturdays? No, <laughs> no. And it's not the problem is more the mindset amongst the people that that God had been limited to something people do a Sunday in a church. And it's almost like God had been limited to that building and what is happening there Sunday where where it should be every day <laughs> like the early disciples came together daily and and we also meet on sundays there's nothing wrong with meeting there but we meet also during the week like many other but if we look at communion for some communion have been removed from a meal that was done in the homes where people in the homes was having a whole meal together a love feast but today we have removed communion from that. So, so I go to church in America and communion is something you do in, in two minutes in the church. You get a little cup and bread thing, and then communion have done, in, in been done with. So, I, but there's many more things about like ministry, like ministries for all of us and, and, and the gospel and baptism. Like you don't need to be ordained to baptize people. Like baptism is part of sharing the gospel and it's for all of us and, and, there's so many other things uh, I'm looking at when we come to the Reformation. And and I don't say a building is wrong. Like we, we have meetings in a building. We, we rent a church building here on the other side and we, we have used that. And But it's, it's, it's just a DNA that is going from, from generation to generation. And I believe we need a new DNA where we really go, go more steeper than we have done before. And, and I'm not part of, I don't know where I stand, to be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm not part of the, the charismatic movement anymore. In many ways, I am charismatic, but I just don't agree with most of what they're doing. I'm also not part of the evangelic movement, but I, I agree with what they're doing. So I stand a little in the middle of all of it. And also, I'm, I'm more into the house church movement. Uh, I believe in that. But... I don't believe we should just come together and have a cozy time in a house and sing Kumbaya. Like, I think there should be a, 
a vision and a goal with why we are coming together. So, so reformation, I think of the church building, but I think about the doctrine, I think about the discipleship, I think about the multiplication and so many other things. So, sorry, I don't know if you can see me on there. Uh, Torben, we did an episode a while ago with a guy named John Mark Ruthven, who's recently passed away due to complications from COVID. Um, but he wrote a book called What's Wrong with Protestant Theology? And in it, he talked about how um, one of the things that happened in the Reformation was when it came to pneumatology, everything that had to do with uh, the new covenant life of the spirit was relegated to soteriology, how a person gets saved and what the, what the Spirit does to sanctify the individual. And he said the problem with that is that it's not actually emphasizing what the Scriptures themselves emphasize. He said, I think something like 70% of the references to the Holy Spirit are almost always, 70% of them are, are always in reference to prophecy and miraculous events. And so, uh, and then he applied that to the Protestant Reformation saying they missed a major thing here. Um, and they distance themselves from this idea that everybody who comes to church has a gift to give away. And so um, what, what do you think about that in regards to, and how have you sort of included that in your last Reformation, this idea that um, church is meant to be a sharing of gifts and uh, around a meal and things like that? Yeah, I always say like that. I, when I met God, I had a longing like everyone who meets God, like Jesus, I want to serve you. How can I serve you? And in my church setting, I, I, I met God in, it was like there was two options. I could preach on Sunday or I could lead to worship. <laughs> I'll be part of worship and, and I cannot sing. So I thought, okay, there's only preaching left. But I was not given that platform. I was like, hey, pastor, look at me. I also want to preach. And, and I start to see that that church is very limited to a few people who are actually serving. The bigger church there are, the more people are passive on Sundays. And, and we need to come back to a model where I believe when you come together, everyone has something to share and everyone take part of church and and all of that. And I don't believe you can do that in a too big setting. You will lose something of it. So for me, I, I looked at the church and it took me on a long, long journey. And there I got in, involved with the house church movement in, in Europe. There's something called Simple Church. And I joined different conferences and worked with, with house church. And, and I got excited until I, I saw the churches and I felt this is just a small version of the big thing. Then I read, I have the big thing. If, if it's all just coming together, have a good time and sing Kumbaya. And it was like, God, he really took us on journey. I started to look at like, okay, what, what, what is church and what needs to be there? And, and one of the things is if you look at a family, like I'm 45 years old now. I am. I'm. I left mom and dad years ago. I got married. I've been married 25 years now. I had three grandkids. For me, my kids, as much as I love them, I don't want them to stay, stay home with mom and dad forever. No, the whole idea is for them to leave mom and dad and then grow up, and then get their own kids. And the Bible says, do you really need somebody to teach you again? the element things in the gospel, like you should all be teachers by now. And I think there is a place where we are just not good enough to make disciples in the way we do church life. And to be a disciple is more than just words. We need the power of God. These have command us to heal the sick. He have command us to preach the gospel. We have command us to cast out demons. And it's not a choice. It's not like, oh, I, I want to just obey him in one of the things. I want to obey. No, we need to obey him in all. For example, when we talk about deliverance ministry, I personally don't believe in deliverance ministry. I, I don't see there is a place in the Bible where we can say, hey, I am, I have a deliverance ministry and the only thing I do is deliverance. And other people, oh, I have a healing ministry, the only thing I do is healing. And other, I have a disciple ministry and the only thing I am is teaching and discipleship. No, I believe we need it all. And as soon as we take one of the elements out, there can be 
the power in the gospel, that can be uh, communion, that can be discipleship, that can be you come together, everyone have something to share. As soon as we remove one of the elements, we will not be truly effective as the body of Christ to make disciples. And I think if I look at the Reformation, I think there's good things many places. Like with baptism, you, you want to ask me about baptism later. I, my theology lean more to the Catholic Church when it comes to baptism, but my practice lean more to the, the, the Protestant movement. I am Protestant in my Baptist practice with full immersion, but I don't believe Baptist is just a symbol and outward sign. I don't believe that. But I disagree with the Catholic that Baptist in itself without faith and repentance can save anyone. So I think the problem for us is we, we often go from one deception to the other. We throw the baby out with a bath water. Uh, baby out with bath water, baptism joke. All of that. <laughs> so, but, but it's with everything. It's with com communion. Commune is just not, not just a sin, just not something we do fast and, and, and everything. We, we are so fast to, to build on our traditions and what we were taught instead of what the word is saying. And I think for me, so it had been a long journey. So to define the last reformation with a few words is actually difficult because there's so many things that have changed in our life the last years. And, but I love it and, and we see good fruit. Well, let's, let's hang out on that baptism question real quick because a lot of people in the comment section are really interested in that right now. Um, <laughs> let's, let's just chat a little bit about baptism. You mentioned, hey, I'm a little bit more Catholic on this side. I'm a little bit more Protestant on this side. I, I, I think I heard you say that you were raised in kind of a nominal Lutheran experience. Uh, and I know that there are brothers in Christ out there that I can look to, like my Lutheran brothers, who would say that baptism saves. And I think many Anglicans would say that baptism saves. Um, but the way that they're defining that is going to be nuanced from the Roman Catholic position. So I'm curious, could you point to a, a Protestant denomination, a Protestant movement and say, you know, I would agree with them on baptism as kind of a catch all. Or do you really think that you have a nuanced position that's really different than a lot of positions out there? So first question is, is there a group? that you can, you know, point to and say, I'm kind of like them when it comes to baptism. Uh, and then, uh, I guess my, I have a follow-up question, but I'll let you, I'll let you tackle that one first. It, I think it's difficult because when I talk with people about my theology, when it comes to baptism, I think when people really understand it, there is more people who, who believe in it and follow it, but they don't practice what they believe. Uh, and then I would say, do they really believe in it? Like, um, if you look at, if you look at book of Acts, I think everyone can agree. If we look at Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10 with Cornelius, Acts 16, the, the jailer and, and Acts 19, Paul and Ephesus, that everyone got baptized right away the same day. Like that was the response they gave, like in Acts 8 with Philip at the eunuch, you don't read what the eunuch was preaching but you read, read still how somehow what he was preaching. Why? Because you read the response. There's water. Can I get baptized? Why don't we get the same response today? There's water. Can I get baptized? Maybe because we don't preach the same gospel. And, and just take Jesus' word alone, Matthew 28. The first he said is make this are baptized in them. In the end of Mark, he said make this the one who believe and are baptized shall be saved. So, so the practice is very clear i think in the bible that that they got baptized right away and why did they do that i believe because they have a theology that was different than mainstream christianity if i look at movement church denomination no i cannot point on on one church denomination who is is doing it the same way we do sorry i i, I don't know of anyone in america who baptize people the same day they come to faith because everyone wants to put it into that box and, the, and that box don't allow it to happen the same day. It can first happen the next Sunday or later. So I cannot point any church denomination, but I, can, I know of many individuals who have read the Bible and say, hey, this is how it should be. And, and, uh, but for me, if I am wrong in my view of baptism, please, I am so open. I want to 
I, I, I'm okay with being wrong in many ways because I feel sometimes I stay a little alone out here. But show me out of the Bible where I'm wrong. Don't come with for our traditions and we do this and we sure. do this. Like I really want to see the, the, what the word is saying. And I would say baptism for me got baptized in Lutheran church. It was a lie. My brother was not a believer. He died when he was 45 years old and he was told that he is now in heaven because he 45 years ago got baptized in the same church. My whole family had been lied to. Baptism in itself don't save anyone. So I see that, but I did the same. I, I went from that lie to the other lie to say the baptism was just a symbol. And I was preaching that for years, even as I eventually was traveling in Denmark. And then I started to co come in conflict with the Bible. I started to see their practice. I started with their practice. What did they do in the book of Acts? And then I thought, okay, if that is their practice, what is their theology? And then I went from their practice to the theology. And, and I, just, I, I just saw nothing about an outward sign for inner faith. I saw nothing about that the baptism is a public proclamation that should happen many months after people come to faith. I saw words as Baptist and I'll save you. I saw words like putting off the old life. And, and as, as if we will use the word sign, the only thing we can say is that circumcision in the Abrahamic covenant is a sign that they belong there. But that sign God took very serious. So when Moses didn't want to circumcise his son in the beginning, God tried to kill him. Now we don't circumcise the foreskin but we put off the whole body when we are circumcised by the baptism into Christ. We read about that Colossians 3. So, so I would say for me, it had been a long journey. And, and it's only the last five, six, seven years I really practice what I believe. But I am convinced of it. We baptized eight people last week. And uh, it was actually a pastor. And we're actually going to pat, baptize another pastor next week. And, and he have seen our podcast and he just told him I was deceived. Like I, I just didn't have the full picture of, of, of everything with the gospel. And, and I'm, I was deceived. And so I see there is an awakening in the world. And I believe that the problem with deception is that we point at everyone else and say they're deceived because we don't understand we have all grown up in deception. Sure. Because who of us came to faith the same way as the digging Acts 2, with repentance, baptism, water, and receiving the Holy Spirit the same day. None of us did that. We, for us, it took months or years, and some people have never gone through it all yet. So I think that is the hardest thing. It's one thing to learn something new. It's totally different to relearn what you've already been taught for years. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll say that for, for us here on Remnant, that I think everyone, I could speak for everyone, they can correct me if I'm wrong. We would all hold that, you know, when we look to the sacraments, that there is something happening. Um, I, I don't think any of us will say regeneration. I don't think any of us will say new birth because of how we understand depravity and how we understand the state of man. But we will say that there's not like a, our, my, my guest from last, uh, yesterday, um, uh, Dr. Fesco says there's no neutral encounters with God. And when we take of the bread and the wine, when we take of baptism, that's an encounter with God in some real sense. And there's something actually happening in the baptismal water, something actually happening in the bread and in the wine. So, so I think on that very broad perspective, I think we can all agree on that. And then additionally, I don't think that any of us are actually going to disagree that this idea that the altar call in conversionism has now replaced baptism, um, that that idea is, you know, um, all too different. Um, I, I will say that I know that the early church, very, very early on, um, in the Didache or Didache, depending on how you want to read it, um, how you want to pronounce it, does go out of its way to suggest that a baptismal candidate should spend three days fasting before being immersed in water. And, and that's like the earliest recorded docu document outside of scripture that we have. And that's not to say that it should supersede scripture, because I do think that even hearing you talk about, hey, let's do it the moment someone comes to conversion. What that is, is a desire to be obedient to the pattern that you see in scripture, which again, I want to commend. I don't want to say, hey, 
the Dadake has got a tradition, so we should hold that above scripture. But it does seem like it's been an early tradition, an early um, practice. I I'd be curious, Roundtree, um, I know we chatted about this on the way back from Kansas City on how um, you know, the altar call has replaced uh, baptism. And I'd be, I'd be curious what some of your thoughts are from Torben just now and if you have any kind of follow-up questions. Oh, well, sure. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Josh. I think that in large measure, the altar call has replaced baptism because there's this sense that like, I need to act, I need to do something to show that I have faith. And, you know, the preacher will say, hey, don't just sit in your seat, come up and show you your faith is real. That's actually what baptism was designed for. And Torben, I, I certainly wouldn't have a problem with baptizing right away. I think there are practical, practical concerns. And I, uh, I mean, not even concerns, just practical issues that crop up as to why churches wait. And of course, one of those practical issues is not enough people get saved. So <laughs> you can know, I read well, we got a baptism in six months because that's all. Can I, can I read a word here? Ephesians 5, 25, husband, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her, the church, holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. Many people read that today like, oh, we are cleansed through the word. No, no, re just read it. Like cleansing is happening by the water. It's the water that is cleansing through the word. The word word here is not logos, it's rhema. It's not through the written word, it's through the revelation. So Christ is cleansing us by the washing of water through the revelation. It's not the water in itself without revelation and that is the problem that we have been preaching uh, i would say in some cases a different gospel and because we are not creating that preaching the true gospel what water truly is and what is happening people don't go down in that water with that rhema that revelation that i'm being cleansed now and therefore you don't see it you don't see the power of baptism and years ago i had no testimony of baptism but like this week the one of guy who got baptized he had been baptized before he, he said to me Torben this was real I I have never been baptized before I know that now because it something just left me I just felt so free like all shame is washed away and I think that is the thing we have removed the um, it, it's not only about the practice it, it's about the doctrines behind the practice. And I think that revelation needs to be there. And, and I just don't see many priests. And, and I think yeah. that is, well, is sad. I, I, and I'd like to finish my question. So, because even on what you said, there are actually plenty of Protestants who would agree with your articulation of it, uh, at least in some measure. I mean, like we had uh, Dr. Jordan Cooper come on. Now he believes in baptizing babies, but other than that, he would articulate baptism in much the same way that you did. Um, but I want to kind of back up for a moment and, and I want to ask just kind of a bigger question, uh, because so Torben, I'm going to be honest, I get a little bit nervous whenever somebody says like, well, I can't really identify with any denomination. I can't really identify with anyone that's out there. I'm not saying that it's impossible. I'm not saying that, you know, God can't do that. I'm sure Martin Luther felt all alone when he was, you know, in the reformation separating from the Roman Catholic church, although he tried to do it within the Roman Catholic Church. But my, my point being, I, I'm not calling you a heretic or anything, but I'd like to just settle the matter here. And, uh, and just to ask, because, you know, 100 people have asked in the chat, you know, is this guy a heretic? So I, I just want to ask if you affirm the historic doctrines of the Christian faith, okay? I mean, so like not just parsing over baptism one way or another, the church has argued over that for 2,000 years. Uh, but do you believe in one God, uh, in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and yet one God. Do you believe in the hypostatic union that Jesus is simultaneously both God and man? Do you believe in justif justification uh, by faith uh, through grace alone and not by works? Do you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture? Do you believe in the historic Christian doctrines? I would say yes. Um, I would say yes. I want to say... I want to come back to this. When I said no church denomination, I've, I've never met so many churches who actually believe what we do, but it's not, it's non-denomination. It's not like, like one big uh, 
church denomination is is churches non-denomination church who believe what i believe mm -hmm. but yes i believe in that uh, but i would say I, i'm a very practical guy uh, and i believe like how how do that look like practical do i believe that faith can stand alone no i don't believe in faith can stand alone but i don't believe that faith plus works by the law or faith plot plus the holy sacrament in the catholic church of confessing to the priest and the hail mary and all of that safe no it is christ and christ alone who save but again how do that look like and i believe you cannot be in christ without true repentance that, that is the beginning and i believe baptism should fall after this and people need to to receive the holy spirit and continue as a disciple but if you look at the different creeds yes i believe in it uh, i i i believe in in everything there but i think I'm, I'm very practical in it and i think you can say a creed and people can sign up yeah i believe in then i say a creed i believe in that uh, but how do it look in their life like how do they mm -hmm. practice live it out and um, okay. but uh, yeah yeah okay well now another question because when you talk last reformation i wonder if you're talking about specifically to the western church because when you talk about house church movement you talk about lots of conversions and fast baptisms i mean in the eastern church in the church of the southern hemisphere i mean uh, you're a world traveler. You know this. this is happening all over the world. I mean, there are conversions like never before, and people are. Uh, I, I mean, could we argue that that what you're contending for in your book is really sort of an appeal to the West to be more like the Church of the East and of the South? Yeah, yeah, and like I love the movie uh, Sheep Among Wolves and and what they're doing and and other people and. But I was I got a shock when I came to America because I. Just the first three months here, I met more pastors who agree with what we are doing that I've done for 10 years in Denmark. So, so I saw that, that the church is much great, greater than Denmark and, and north of Europe, where we still have a state church religion. So I met many more churches and people and ministries here than I've done in, in Europe. But yes, I, I really, I see more in the Eastern uh, places like when I got involved with the sim simple church movement in Europe, I remember in the beginning I was like, "Beautiful, beautiful! I want to see. It. Tell me what is happening. Go to to Pakistan or go to India. Yeah, but I don't live there. What is happening in Europe? Hey, go to Iran. Go to there and go to there. And I was like, yeah, "But I'm not there. I'm in Europe. I'm in the Western world, and I want to see it in the Western world. So I would say yes. I, I'm really." working more on getting the western world back to to some of the third world in other places where we see a move of god and i believe it's possible here and we are seeing it we are seeing four or five generation of fellowship starts starting now and and it is really beautiful but we need to again the the tradition of man are so much steeper here like when i was in jordan and and other places and I met people who, who don't have any church background. It's it's just a different approach. It's much easier in some ways. So, um, and uh, but I believe there is is a place for the Western Church also in all of this. So Torben, uh, this is I'm gonna take a little bit of a left turn here, but it's because I'm I'm genuinely curious about this, and I'm I'm probably gonna ask you uh, later in a later conversation. When we're not on in the air, but I would like to know. How is it that the finding a person of peace, what does that look like? I know you've, I've got a book that you sent me on that very thing. And I know that it's, it's often involves rev revelation, gifts of the spirit that sort of point you in the right direction. And this is why you're seeing so many conversions and so many baptisms. Is that correct? Yeah. We, uh, Saturday, we had a meeting with a, a priest down in, in San Diego is a, a pastor, a pastor, sorry, pastor I started working with. And, and we are doing a training with him and his leadership for, by four Tuesdays. And we started Saturday where I just shared the vision and shared like, what, what do I see Jesus was called us to do? 
he did not only say Matthew 28, God made disciple. He in in Luke 9, Luke 10, Matthew 10 was more specific in how that discipleship looked like. And and one of the things was finding the person of peace. Uh, like Acts 16, Paul came, there was a group of women who was praying. He spoke to all of them, but there was one woman, Lydia, where we read that the Lord opened her heart. She was a person of peace. The same check so we see the jailer where he asks, what must I do to get saved? That is a sign that is a person of peace, somebody God is calling. But in every episode, when you see that, no one just invited them to church on Sundays. They took the time to really sit down with them and explain the gospel. And you cannot explain the gospel in a three minutes or two minutes or five minutes. You, you really need to go deep. What, what did Christ do on the cross? How he died, how he got buried and he rose up again. Now we need to die for our sins, repent toward God the Father. And then we need to be buried, put off that old body by being baptized into Christ. And then as Christ was raised up, we need the Holy Spirit to come in and rise us up to the newness of life. And so what I did Saturday, I shared the gospel and one guy, he got baptized and he experienced freedom. And I, and I said to him, now what I did with you, you go and do with others. And we were together yesterday again, and he have already seen three people got baptized in water, set free from demons and filled with the Holy Spirit. Already three days after. In his case, it was somebody he knew who loved Jesus, but they have not fully understand repentance. They love Jesus, but have never got baptized. They love Jesus, but never received the Holy Spirit. And they came in church, but people don't become disciples by just coming in church. We need to be better to sit down with them and then take them through the gospel. So what we do is really encrypting people and training people in how do you take people to the gospel? How do you take them from being a sinner, hating God, to be fully born again, filled with the Holy Spirit and a disciple of Christ? And I don't believe we can train everyone to go to Africa and stand on a platform with a mic. And it costs a lot of money and big organization and ministry. But everyone can find a person of peace. Like Jesus went to the woman at the well Everyone can find one person. Everyone can sit down over a coffee table and share the gospel with people. And I think this is where multiplication happens. And this is what we need to be better as in the church to really disciple people. Like if you have been a Christian 10, 15 years, and if a sinner come up to you and you still need to bring him to the church for the pastor to share the gospel with him, then the pastor is a disciple that is good but are you a disciple like we should all yeah. learn to do this and so this is the thing and i think the whole thing i have a vision and idea and know what jesus called us to do because if we don't know about a person of peace if we don't know what a person of peace is and know what jesus wants us to do when we find a person of peace we are like a boxer hitting in the air like we don't hit anything we don't know what we are doing and and we go out to evangelize and come home without seeing fruit and like yesterday, we, we went to Chick-fil-A and, and I talked with a girl on Chick-fil-A and God just brought us together and she ended up coming back with me to the meeting. Hold on, we, Hold on. We there had are unsaved work. people? Are there unsaved people in Chick-fil-A? <laughs> uh, there are a whole lot of places. Outside the church, right. there are. <laughs> but I was Bro, saved. did you not know that those waffle fries were a sacrament? But, but, it but leads you know, people to Christ. <laughs> but, but you know, uh, Josh, it's the Chick-fil-A sauce. Lydia and, Lydia and Acts 16, she was a worship of God. So she was a prayer, praying woman, but she didn't understand who Christ was. So, so it's not only hardcore sinners, it's also people who actually grow up in religion who, who need to be born again. I just want to remind you guys that you did a thumbnail about cast now demons and we haven't talked about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, I tried okay. to talk about it a little bit there at the beginning. That Sorry. baptism question came up and, you know, yeah, Let, the let's devil's talk. I have a question. Us. Uh, this is from Dustin Aguilar, who's actually a friend of mine and who took over my last church. And Dustin's in the chat. Hey, Dustin. Here's what he says. He says, "What do you always? Why do you always pray in tongues when casting out demons and praying for baptism in the spirit?" And I'm, I, I don't know that that is what you do, but that's what he says. That's his perception of what you do. So first, is that what you do? And second, if so, why? And I've seen three whole videos, and I've seen that you have. 
So I'm not saying yeah. that you always do, no, but in the I three videos first, that I watched, you did. I, I don't <laughs> always do it, but I do it often. And and the way you I just approach, do it when you're filming. No, the, the way I approach. <laughs> He's showing off his tongue game. Wait, the, that's the, weird. The, Ew, sorry. The, the way I the way I approach people is more. I I don't believe deliverance uh, not in the new covenant. We are living in to stand alone. I think we. Uh, there's something deliverance can do and there's something deliverance cannot do. Like there is also the whole uh, renewing the mind that needs to be taking place. There is also uh, a forgiveness that needs to take place of hurt and we want people to get filled with the Holy Spirit. So what I often do, I, I do it all somehow at the same time. So I actually, uh, like this Saturday, a woman, I asked somebody, we had a meet, I asked anyone who had not received the Holy Spirit and speaking tongues. And there was one woman, she came, and she came up and I said, uh, you love Jesus? Yes, you have repented. Yes, you have been baptized. Yes, but you don't speak in tongues and receive the Holy Spirit. No. Uh, do you want it? And she said, I've been wanting that for seven years. I said, okay. Okay, let, let, let me, do you need freedom, other areas, anxiety, depression, and all of that? And she had a lot of other baggage. So what I do, I just take them and take everything right away. And I just pray for, for freedom and deliverance. And, and, and then I, I often pray in tongues. And some of the things, I think it's also for me to just have a pause. It is, uh, it just lost the stream. It's getting again. glitchy for me. Yeah, it seems a little glitchy on our end. Is, I is kept everyone off? on, so it makes Did me feel like Corbin? we're... We're still streaming. I I, I, I jump back on, guys. So, Torben, I apologize. They're just there at That's the right. end. It cut you off. So, <laughs> can, I can't tell you that I know exactly what you were saying at the exact moment. Right. So, if anyone... anyone I, I would say... To, he was speaking in tongues. Yes. No. Casting <laughs> demons out of you, Josh. Well, I, I don't know. I, I just like to speak in tongues uh, when I do deliverance. I think maybe... I don't know. To be honest, it's not something I've been aware of. Why do I do it? And... If I think back, it's not always I do it, but but I feel at the same time it's, it's really stirring something up in me. It's like sure. stirring up my faith when I speak in tongues. And at the same time, it gives me a pause in my mind to like, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? What is happening here? Because I don't focus when I pray in tongues. So so I think it's, it's just a way I do it. it. It don't have to be like that. And it's not always like that. Um, yeah. Torben, let me ask you this, because I, I think I might be understanding where, where uh, Dustin is coming from. Uh, personally, you know, uh, your your testimony of praying in tongues so that, that the Holy Spirit can bring things to mind is a personal experience that, that I've had, and I think that the guys here would say yes and amen to as well. Uh, but I think the, the question from Dustin is more of a contextual question that, you know, when we're gathered together with the assembly, if we're speaking in tongues and there's an unbeliever present, or maybe we're out in public and we're speaking in tongues while casting a demon out, there are unbelievers who are present, um, but that, that maybe we're do we're practicing a gift of the spirit that's out of order in first Corinthians 14, you know, that if we speak in tongues, we should have an interpreter so that others can, you know, yes and amen our prayer uh, so that, that we're all in agreement. So can you maybe weigh into that a little bit? I think that might have been the direction of his question. When, when I do meetings and kickstart training and teach, I would not stand up and speak in tongues, uh, my person tongues in a meeting. Uh, I don't do that. We, we, we have, if we have tongues, we have interpretation as we read. And, and, and it's so beautiful when, when tongue and interpretation come together in a meeting. I think for me, when, when I do the videos uh, also, I, I'm, I'm really, I know there's a lot of unbeliever who's seen it, but I'm, I'm really trying to reach the believers to make this more like, let them aware, know what is happening. And, and if we le read a read book of Acts, like when Philip and I person came to Samaria in Acts 8, they, they spoke in tongues properly, like people know it. It was not a secret. And even a guy like Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given by the hands of the apostles. So so he saw that they were they were speaking in tongues there. And I does, does Acts 8 say that they were speaking in tongues? No, okay, no. It was not written, but he saw the Holy it Spirit was implied, given by the hands of the apostle. But it's inclined because of Acts 10 and Acts 19, uh, where where we see it more in details. So that is correct. But 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 it happened. It happened out there, and, and where, when people got filled with the Holy Spirit and and people speaking tongues, 
And and this is what I do out on the street. It's happened there when people get filled with the Holy Spirit, like in, in, in as other places. So I think the way I read it is when Paul, he said uh, in the context, that was in context of a meeting. That was in context of a church meeting that if you have a meeting and you stand up on the pulpit and the only thing you do for five minutes are speaking in tongues, they think you are crazy. Then prophesy instead. So they fall down on the knee and worship God. Uh, so in meetings, I don't, I don't speak in tongues like that. Uh, I, uh, so, but out there, I think my, 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 also with my move, our movies, The Last Wave of Mason Life in the beginning, I really want to show what the book of Acts looked like. And, and I want to show the world out there because I met people, especially in Europe, where people grow up and then they find out their parents spoke in tongues, but they have been a secret for 20 years and they did not know it. And, and it's almost like a, like a, oh, keep away from tongues and it's weird and so on. So I, I think I just have in my heart that, that people need to know is part of the Christian life. Um, yeah. Uh, Torben, what is your process for casting out demons? What do you do? Nothing. Besides Pray. speaking tongues. Uh, no, I don't Can know. Can you practice on tongues. Roundtree right now? No, I actually, I, I need to share something then. Uh, it, it, you, you need to give me a few minutes here. Um, first thing, I, I, I have issues, to be honest, with, with most deliverance ministries out there. I, I, I do things very different and... and 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 i i'm very simple in it i i don't i most of the doctrine i see we are building on is is not from the bible it's more by experience and it's doctrines from demons or talking with demons and, and coming out with theology i'm i'm very simple in it like i don't talk with demons i go don't go in and do a lot of things i'm like okay what is the problem let's pray and and I want to tell a story there. Years ago, when I started to, to pray for healing and deliverance, I, I saw God move and do beautiful things. But at the same time, like everyone else, I wanted to see more. And I was listening to a lot of teaching and doctrines and theology. And, and then I read a book about hindrance from healings, things that could hinder people in being set free or, or he, healings. And one of the things that was written there was on forgiveness. And I read it and then I did a meeting and a woman came up and prayed for her. Nothing happened. I prayed again and nothing happened. I prayed again and nothing happened. And then I remember what I read. So I said, anyone you need to forgive? She said, yes. Who? My boyfriend, ex-boyfriend. I, I cannot forgive him. I said, hey, if you cannot forgive, you cannot get set free. Because it, it was what I just read. And there she forgave and I prayed for her again. And boom, she got set free. And I was like, whoa, it's working. I did another meeting. I experienced the same. And I thought, interesting. So I actually gave out a teaching myself of hindrance of healing and deliverance. And one of them was, you need to forgive. Otherwise, you cannot be set free and so on. But then I did another meeting. And there was a woman who did not get set free. And I said, what? Anyone you need to forgive? And she said, no. And I thought, hmm. What is then the hindrance? Are you sure? She said, yes. Okay, what is then the hindrance? What about this? What about this? What about generation curse? Do you have anything in your house? What about this? And suddenly it took me away, far away from what I saw in the Bible of simple faith. And I ended down on a slip this slow where I almost start to interview people and find out what is the issue and 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 why do they not get set free and and, and do they have things in the house is a generation things is the things they need to do first is it do they have sin in their life hidden sin there is a hindrance and and I became confused and I was like I don't understand it God God that woman when I gave the teaching out that woman got set free because she forgave. And then it was like God spoke to me and said, no, she did not get set free because she forgave. She got set free because you believe that if she forgave, she would be set free. And when she forgave, it activated your faith. And it was by faith she got set free. I don't say that people don't need to forgive. That is important. 
But Jesus never lined people up. The multitude came and they all got set free. They all got healed. There was not a time Jesus said, oh, you need to forgive and you need to repent for this first. No, you are forgiving. Go and sin no more. You are healed. Go and sin no more. First they gave the freedom and then they were told, go and sin no more. And I start to see, whoa, I, I've done it wrong here. And I start to see it's by faith. It's by faith. And I, I need to repent. And I came back to something where I, I really believe is, is simple faith. It, you don't need to confess. It's good to confess. You don't need to repent for all your sin. You don't need to do all of this. I think it's important to repent for sins. It's important to forgive. But I re believe it comes down to simple faith. And that is why when, when I go out on a street, I can go to a stranger I don't need to interview him first. I don't need to sit down with him and, and talk for 10, uh, 10 minutes, a half hour to find his life story before I can set him free. I believe we can just go in and say, what is the issue? And then if it's, it's depression, it's fear, it's anxiety, what, what it is, is, is nightmares, is, is, is addiction to different things. We can go in and say, I command you spirit of addiction. I command you spirit of nightmare. I command you spirit of fear. I command you unclean spirit, leave right now. And this is my theology, keep it simple. And this is the thing, if you line up, if you into you deliverance ministry, you can line up 10 deliverance ministry who are all saying different things and who all have different result. And they all have some good result, but they don't have good result because they do this or because those people do that. And because those people do that, they have good result because they believe if I do this, there is a free. Or if I believe if we do this, there is a free. Because it comes down to faith, simple faith. And this is my theology. And and like I know you already talked about, but I have a you view of Leviathan that is different, like Jezebel. I just I don't see Jezebel spirits in the Bible. Like I, I know most deliverance ministry follow it, but if you go to Revelation 2. You cannot read Revelation 2 and conclude it's a demon. I, I just don't see it in the Bible. Well, we we're talk with about you. We agree. The, doc, the doctrine, the doctrine, talk about teaching that lead to sexual sin. Um, so for me, I'm a guy who wants to keep it simple. And, and if, if I don't see it in the Bible, let's don't go there. Yeah, I think that we, we're, we're also as equally skeptical as everything's a demon and there's a demon of everything. Um, I do think that uh, the normative, I say normative practice of uh, walking people through repentance is something that both Michael and Michael and I would, would typically hold to in deliverance ministry. Would, would any of you guys yeah. want to give any pushback? I, I, I would coming? nuance that. We're already on the heels of the show at 510 yeah. right now. So Can I add one thing there just to not sure. misunderstand me? Uh, now we talk about deliverance. Um, I think deliverance should never be alone divided from the gospel it should never be alone divided from discipleship because deliverance is very often not enough in itself there need to be more there need to be a renewal of the mind afterward they need a discipleship and we need the gospel for example let's say a person come up to us problem with uncleanness and he said i have an unclean spirit I've had people come from deliverance ministry to deliverance ministry and they never got set free. And then they come to us and we talk and we pray and like, and we looked at them like, Hey, do you know why you have a problem with your porn? Because you are a sinner who love your sin. Repent. W what are you thinking? Repent. No one have ever said that before. And they became angry <laughs> and then they go out and repent and come home and are free. So, because it's not always a demon. Very often it's repentance that needs to take place. Other times it's just a renewing of the mind that needs to take place. So when I said I deal with repentance always and you know, often, but when it's demon and deliverance, you don't need to focus on all of that. But very often the issue is not only that, the issue is so many other things and we need to deal with at the same time. So it sounds like Torben, you, you're probably not very far off from us on this. Um, I think the, I tend to lead people through a prayer of repentance on the front end. 
Um, though there have been times where after a person gets delivered, I then lead them through a prayer of repentance. Uh, but that's because on that second occasion, the person had manifested a demon and was gone. And so I kicked the demon out and then I got to talk to the person. Um, so I, the, the idea that repentance of sin is often uh, a part of deliverance is not a hard, th I would always advocate that. Um, but is it necessarily required to get the demon out on the uh, on the front end? No, no. Oftentimes, I think we can get people delivered, and then we talk to them about their sin that got them demonized to begin with, uh, for the sake of renewing their mind and repentance and turning from sin in general. So, I, I think it's just the way that you're talking about it would be probably a little bit different. But it sounds like we believe the same thing and practice yeah. the same thing. Yeah, I, if I, I think, say and uh, if I could just chime in really quick, Torben. <laughs> Uh, if I was to maybe give a little bit of pushback for including repentance, and and I will say, along with Miller, I actually agree with you big picture on uh, on deliverance because I think it's way complicated out there. It doesn't need to be complicated. In the Gospels, it's not complicated. I think faith is, is kind of the big thing. Uh, so I, I would agree with you on that. <clears throat> uh, I, I think for me, I think of uh, a few things. Like if I just had the Gospels, but not the book of James. I might think healing only happens in response to, f like, faith is it. You have faith, you get healed. Uh, but then in James 5, it says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And so James actually gives us a little bit more detail. And then, and when we think about that, confession, which certainly involved repentance, being tied to the need for healing. But I, I would also say this, um, Healing, I, I put casting out of demons actually under the same category as healing. They're, they're so married together. I mean, yeah. Jesus will cast out a deaf and dumb spirit and somebody is delivered of a demon and healed at the same time. So these are so closely married together. While demons aren't mentioned in James 5, principally, it, they might as well have been, almost. And, and I say that because healing and deliverance are so closely connected throughout the New Testament. I would also look at Mark chapter 1 where Jesus steps on the scene and he says, you know, the kingdom of God is here, repent and believe the gospel. We consistently see repent and believe together. And I appreciate what you say about salvation, like repent and believe. Both of these are necessary for somebody to get saved. But, uh, but I would extend that beyond just eternal salvation, going to heaven, uh, you know, participating in the new age. Uh, of the kingdom and okay, not new age, the religion, but the kingdom. Okay. Um, yes. So s saved counts as all of those things, but I would also think like, Hey, it also applies to deliverance when Jesus in Matthew 12, 28 says, uh, says, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So God reigns over that person. And that reign is demonstrated by the removal of a demon. Well, Jesus tells us how to get the reign of God over our lives, repent and believe the gospel. So, so I, think, uh, I think what I would say is I feel comfortable leading people through prayers of repentance and association with deliverance. And I think there is there can be sort of a loosening of the ground in that respect uh, for, for deliverance ministry. However, I big picture agree with you. Let's keep it simple. Believe, you say, I say, repent, believe. You know, I, I see those as two sides of the same yeah. coin. But, and I would say, like, when you talk about uh, the woman who are caught in adultery, Jesus said, your sins is forgiven, and then go and sin no more. And we read again different places, so not anything worse shall be happened to you. Jesus said that in connection with go and sin no more, but that is the same we see in connection with uh, cast now demons that those demons will come back seven times worse. So I, I really believe in discipleship and deep, deep repentance and confessing of sins and all of it. But what I want to say is that it often happened afterwards. Go and sin no more. Now you're forgiven. Now you are free. Now you are this. Go and sin no more. But it depends on what context, again, because out on the street, when we are preaching the gospel and meeting people, it happens. Like we, we pray for our healing and suddenly the demons start to manifest and then we go directly into deliverance. But if I have people coming to me and sitting down with them, I will, of course,
go from the beginning and take everything at one time with deep repentance and what the gospel is and so on. I just say it's not necessary that you, you have to sit down with people because it's really the faith in Christ and what he has done that can set people free. Yeah, so social context in this matters a significant amount. And I think the the thing is, is when most of us are thinking about casting out demons, we're normally thinking about praying for somebody after a church service. Whereas I think when Torben is thinking about casting out demons, he's thinking about in the context of being at a T-Mobile shop, <laughs> praying for a person who's not a believer. Thankfully, thankfully. And so, yeah, I, and I... And I actually think that's commendable. And I, I wish that my immediate thought when I was thinking of casting out demons was in the context of the streets rather than in my own church service. So there, there's something if, to be mentioned on the social context there. If you look at the Bible, one thing I, I'm, I'm too truly mixed when it comes to the living in America. I'm, I'm so excited that so many people get their eyes open for deliverance, but I'm very, very concerned that people get hype on deliverance and, and oh, totally. people just like only do deliverance, deliverance. And I want to still remind that we have 21 letters, John, James, Peter, Jude, uh, and there's issues in the church, but we don't, we see talk, take on the arm of God, but we don't say, see how Paul, he look at the church in Corinth, where there's a big issue say, Hey, you just cast out those demons. No, we talk about repentance and, and church discipline and, and, and reminding people what Christ did and, and what happened in, at, at, at their salvation. And I don't see in the 21 letters a lot of deliverance happening. I don't see it. But I see that people came to faith where they also, I believe like Philip in Samaria, deliverance happened beforehand. It happened right away and they got the whole package right away. And I hope that we come to a place where we really deal with the gospel and go so much deeper in the beginning and people experience deliverance in the beginning that is then we're done with. And then now we can move on in Christ. And But I see like people go from deliverance to deliverance, from deliverance to the deliverance. And the only thing that come out of their mouth is demons and, and, and Satan. And what the heart is full of is running over and and... But it's easy, like Jesus said in, in Luke, Luke 10, when he said, send the disciples out, he said, heal the sick and preach the kingdom of God. Uh, he did not say cast out demons, but we knew it was part of healing the sick because they came home rejoicing that the demons were subject in his name. But there Jesus said, don't rejoice over that. Don't rejoice that demons obey you. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. And I, I, I see a, a new generation of people who get high on deliverance and Deliverance should be natural. It, it is part of it. Like I'm not a deliverance guy. I'm not a healing freak. I don't read books about healing all the time and deliverance. But I love Jesus and I'm a disciple and I want to obey him. And I don't see as a disciple that I can choose only to preach the gospel or choose only to heal the sick or choose only to cast out demons or choose only to make disciples. No, I see as a disciple of Christ, I'm called to do it all but I'm not called to just do one of it. And I, that is my heart to really say, guys, I, I don't believe in deliverance ministry. I believe in deliverance should be part of being a minister of Christ, but we should do it all. And, and, and it's not everything that is a demon, but some things is demonic. And I often say it like this, we are called to cast out the demon and renew the mind. The problem is when we mix it up and cast out the mind and renew the demon. And this is what we often see. Funny. Okay, cool. Hey, probably, Josh, maybe this one last question, because I think sure. there's another half the, of our title the of question. the episode we should touch on. Yeah, this is Judah Dawkins. He says, uh, question, wonder if it's helpful to get info on the other half of the subject matter, potentially having to commit civil dis disobedience in the future, given what he said he heard in prayer in the coming years. So you talked about, uh, hey, the same thing's coming to America, maybe other Western nations. And uh, what is this thing that's coming? Is it persecuting charismatics who cast out demons? Is it persecuting Christians who practice their faith? Can you talk to us a little bit more about that and what righteous civil disobedience might look like in that context? I would say that we... Uh... When, when Jesus sent his disciples out in Luke 10, he said, I send you out as lamb and one wolf. In, in Matthew 10, he added that we should be 
innocent as dove and 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 and, uh, and uh, as servant there servants um we need to be wise and i would say i, I want to say to new people out there and it comes for me don't put everything on youtube <laughs> and yeah but tom you put a lot on youtube yeah but but my name is already there i am already being looked at and and i know that that things are happening and and there's more i can say i don't want to say it public here but but there's things going on and and we have a very interesting case i can talk with you guys about private later but but things is happening behind the scene and there is some very evil powers who is trying to persecute people and and we have people now who are doing uh, training for semi in in canada where it, it it there have just been a tv program in canada about the people the same as i experienced in europe and there is some agenda going on right now and and the whole thing of about the the conversion law that's coming now also in canada not convert uh, homosexual people and it started in Europe and then it go to Canada and often it come to the United States uh, afterward. So it is happening. It is coming. And I think right now there's freedom. But I say right now be wise in, in what you post and how you do it because things are changing. And I often say like this, before I came to Denmark, if people said to, left Denmark, people said to me, Torben, could you ever imagine, could you ever, ever imagine that you would be forced to leave Denmark. I was like, no, mm. my Danish passport, no. I've been traveling in 37 countries. Denmark is an amazing country when you travel all over the world. I've never had issues. I could never imagine it happened, but it happened. Then I came to America in the last three years, I've been warning people. And before the election, before COVID, I, I said to people, if you think you will not have in America, you are wrong. It's coming to a city near you. Many people did not imagine it, but it is happening. Right now, there's freedom. But I say right now, be wise. Be wise in what you post and what you do, because people are following you. Like our, my Danish, my online YouTube video, my pioneer training school is all being written down to the Danish government, to the European government. In Europe, we had to send in everything we are preaching. And I'm not part of the state church and the church there, but they write down my sermons uh, and put it in. So people are looking at us and it is a question of time before they will start to come after people. And they will start, of course, in the top and those people are most influenced. I just see it like well, we the un, un, underground church is coming to America, and I would say keep obeying Christ, keep doing what is right, and as we should obey the laws in the country as long as they don't go against the law of our Lord Jesus Christ. And He have commanded us to cast out demon, and heal the sick, and preach the gospel. And as soon as they forbid us to do that, we will be criminal because we need to obey Christ first. But then. It would be more like underground things where we had to be more wise with posting it and other things. Well, we do have one thing in America that you don't have in Denmark, and that is Elon Musk. He's saving social <laughs> That's media. That's pretty great. He likes to like <laughs> buy things like Twitter. I'm sure you've you've heard of Elon. He's very yeah, popular. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 yeah we'll see what happens there. I don't know. I'm kinda I'm I'm pretty convinced that we're gonna see freedom of speech get get attacked here in the States. Um, what what I saw happen in Denmark. Oh, look, it's already being attacked. I muted him. Did you guys see that? That was, that was clever. I'm just kidding. Miller. Keep going. I apologize. <laughs> that joke. <laughs> it, was uh, bad, it was funny. In the state church, they do. They, 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 there are certain kind of things that they're not allowed to say from the pulpit. And so once the government starts dictating to the church what it can and cannot do uh, when it comes to practicing their faith, you've got some some problems on your hand. And I think, uh, I think we, we'll... I think we're seeing that in Canada, and I think we're going to see it here as well. And and my admonition to every believer out there, and this is actually what I've told my church, is if they ask you to wear a mask, wear a mask. They're not asking you to sin by wearing a mask. Uh, and I think sometimes we've we've created uh, a false um, sense of uh, these are my rights. It's the moment they ask you to sin that you rebel. It's the moment they ask you to stop being obedient to Christ and what is clearly spelled out in scriptures that you rebel. Um, 
when they tell you to wear a mask, you're not sinning by wearing a mask. Uh, so I, and I'm not, I, I could care less about the mask issue. Honestly, I don't really have a big dog in that fight, but I've just seen this happen where, where we're getting angry about the wrong things. Um, the things we but, should but, be responding to are when they start telling us to not follow Jesus Christ. But, but I think the COVID thing should have been a wake up call for the church. Because right. Because like, like, and here in San Diego, in LA, actually, there is a big church called the Rock Church. And we work with one of the pastors there. And even before, just before COVID, God spoke to the pastors of, of transforming the church from being a kind of mega church with 3,000 people to now being 179 house fellowships. And, and it's really beautiful how, how things are happening. And we work with another church that is also starting to ask a lot of questions here, like, because the COVID, I think it's just a kind of wake up call, because if if something like that can shut down the church, what what, what will not happen in the future? But I, I want to say persecution is needed in the West. I, I think persecution is actually, the lack of persecution is actually our problem, because if you look at the Matthew, Mark 4, the four grounds, ground number two is those people who experience persecution and fall away. Ground number four is and three is those who are, being deceived by the deceitfulness of riches and worries and longing for other things. And then we had a good ground. America is full up of ground number two and three. Like, like people are, are converted, but they're not disciples. They, they are really not ready to follow Christ and die for Christ. And persecution will get rid of some of those people. So we end up with true disciples who are ready to lay down the life for Christ. And, and this is what we see in other countries. Persecution is, is the same as growth. And so I think it's, it's not bad what is happening, even it's not like for us, just a thing, how it's hard, weird. Um, our son, we are family people. Our son and daughter-in-law uh, had three grandkids. We have started a uh, Bible school here in San Diego. We have a Bible school in Mexico also. They have been in Mexico over the border. They have been one and a half hour from us, but we cannot see them. We cannot see our grandkids. We had three of them. We have not seen our granddaughter walk. They are one and a half hour from us. We cannot see them. They cannot come into the country because they've been here too many times and they've been banned for a year and we cannot leave the country because we haven't got our papers yet. So our friends can go over the border and see them, but we cannot see them. It's hard. It's, it's, it's weird to be divided for your family suddenly and, and Lena's parents is alive and we cannot go home and see them. But it's, it's a cost we all need to, to, are we willing to pay this cost? Are we willing to be a disciple to follow Christ? And, and I think it's, we need persecution. And, and I, I think it's actually the only hope for the church that persecution come, because then we need to look at how have we been preaching the gospel? Like, do we have co converts or do we have disciples? And I would say most mega churches we have in America, most things we look up to now, they would disappear overnight that day persecution really set in. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree. There was a comment that, that came in here by holistic discipleship ministries saying, hey, I don't think we need persecution. I, I don't know if uh, you you might be taking what he's saying out of context, maybe, and maybe, you know, you just full stop think there's no persecution i think we're talking in the like minor prophet sense of persecution when you read the minor prophets uh they speak of god um orchestrating certain events that take place in such a way that cause a wicked people that are his people um to repent um and and some would say but it's the goodness of god that leads men to repentance but again if you read the minor prophets he says he brings this calamity on people in order that they would they would back up and go wait, it was better when we served the Lord. And then the Lord is gentle with them in that season. So it looks like the minor prophets seem to talk about God using goodness and like persecution to bring people back to faithfulness unto God. So I, I don't think that you can just take a blanket statement like, you know, we need persecution and someone go, ah, that's, that's just an overestimation. I mean, I think that what Torben's talking about is the historic church 
globally uh, where persecution has been. The church has grown uh, throughout history. You know, as Egypt persecuted Israel, they they multiplied uh, over and over again in the scriptures. Even uh, the greatest missions movement in the book of Acts started because there was persecution. So the disciples spread out and dispersed, uh, caused dispersed. That's not the right word. Um, dispersed throughout <laughs> the world to preach the gospel in different regions. Here, where's that mute button again? I need to I need to quench some free speech. Uh, there, Miller's gone. Um, he's laughing at me, making up words. Uh, dispersed. Yeah, Josh. Uh, dispersed. I think I would actually. I think I would agree with the objection. I, I don't think we quote need persecution. Although I get your point, Torben. I think God uses persecution; it's really good. But First Timothy two does tell us to pray for kings and those who are in authority, so that there will be peace in the land, so that people will seek and find God. Yeah, but so, when, when I say persecution, I think also in the big picture of the person level, because woe unto you when they speak good about you. Those did that at the false prophet, and a godly man will experience persecution. And I think so. Uh, Jesus learned obedience through his suffering, and and I think there is a place where where we as Christians are wanted to be loved by everyone. And and it's so far from the Bible. Like Jesus said, don't think I came with peace, but with strife. There will be division from now on, two against three and three against two in the same household. So when we are preaching the gospel, when we are making disciples, as I say in the beginning, you can believe in the right thing without experience persecution, but when you start to obey, welcome to a real world. Now, now you have an enemy who hate you. That kind of persecution, I think, is starting a person level, and we need to be faithful in that. Also, when it comes to persecution, and and very often it starts with family and friends, and then from there I go into sometimes be the church and people around us. But but it it should be part of our life. And I would say if if we don't see any kind of persecution, I, I think there's something wrong. I think we are not the right place. We are not light and salt in this world. Yeah, we got to land this plane, guys. I really appreciate you coming on, Torben. Uh, we kind of went a little bit over because we got four people all wanting to talk and ask questions. So uh, it's mostly Michael and Michael's fault is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, blessings, guys. Thank you so much <laughs> for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. Torben, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, guys, I had a, a lot of fun in our discussion. It was good to get to know you a little bit and your ministry. And I look forward for maybe collaborating in the future. Uh, but sorry we derailed the conversation with some of the the banter in the comment section about, uh, you know, ecclesiology and baptism and all the other stuff. But it was good to hear your heart and hear about your ministry a bit. It was a lot of fun. Come on. Blessings, guys. Guys, guys. Thank you for what you're doing. Blessing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, blessings. Uh, uh, just as a reminder to everyone, we're crowdfunded, so there's links in the description if you want to support the channel. Uh, lots of really cool stuff that came out of Kansas City last week. So if you give on Patreon, you get access to that content early. So uh, we'll see you next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Blessings.